So over this weekend, I was at a really beautiful boy. We had a business. He opened the door for me. He bought me flowers. We went to the movies. And then afterwards, we had candlelight dinner. We were strolling on the beach. And then I woke up. <laughs> and then I approached the issue about dreams and how the significance of dreams has changed over time. I'm called back to talk on the subject because I've taken psychology and also done extensive research while doing this speech. Since we all dream, it is a benefit to us to be able to see different outlook on dreams. By doing so, we can better understand the importance of dreams for all time. I'm going to highlight some of the important ancient and modern figures. <laughs> Throughout history, dreams have been interpreted in many different ways. Dreams have been often thought of being a way for God to communicate to his people. Historians have found that Egyptians saw dreams refer to the supernatural world to one of the nature. According to Elita Strato, an historian, she said that Egypt thought dreams were so significant that the process of dream incubation started. Dream incubation is where a person, when they had trouble with their life, they would go to the temple and they would sleep there, and then in the morning they would awake and tell their dreams to priests for interpretation. Dream books were also used to help interpret different symbols in dreams. I have this picture here. Um, this is one of the hieroglyphics that were found interpreting a dream. The birds in the dream would have been thought to be um, a sign of eternal life, and then the guy being dead, they would have thought that he meant that he was going to have like a long life. And the snakes would have been a sign of power down here. And the lion would have been a sign that um, he would be pharaoh in the afterlife. Egyptians weren't the only ones who used, um, who believed that dreams were meaningful. In Chief China held dreams in high regard. They thought that it foreshadowed things to come. According to the book Psychology of Court of Concepts, they believed that the souls wandered outside the body during dreams. It also states that they use dreams as medical assistance in medical diagnosis. They would use different emotions displayed in dreams to better understand what was happening to the body. For example, Henry Fong, a Chinese historian, he found that some Chinese would explain a person dreaming about fires to that meant that they had a heart illness, and if they dream about large body waters, that meant that they had something wrong with their liver. This is still used in China today. Um, this they believe that spirits tell the body what's wrong with the mind through dreams. Although the two civilizations have, um, have their beyond dreams, today the modern times reveal the new outlook on dreams. Since science has discovered what happens to the brain during sleep, which helps explain new theories of dreams. I have um, here, this shows the dream cycle, or the cycle of that we dream. Um, the first and second feels you fall asleep, and then the third and fourth, you're in a restful sleep, and your breathing and heart rate slows. And then the fifth stage is where your brain is active and you start to dream. And this is called the rapid eye movement dream, or REM, the REM cycle. Um, MedicalDictionary.com says dreams take about 20 to 25 percent of a person's sleep each night. If a person sleeps eight hours, they get one hour of dreams, which is in the REM cycle. Now that we understand what happens to us physically during dreams, we can, it can help us better understand the new modern theories of dreams. Sigmund Freud, a psychologist, came up with a psychoanalytic theory. This is where um, he says that two functions happen during, sleep, um, during dreams. That first, it helps the person stay asleep, and then second, it serves as a portal to the unconscious desires. Unlike any other, um, this is unlike any other theory that has been stated, and it shows how our dreams connect with our daily life. So if you have like a good dream, then you would think like you have good thoughts and you dream about like good things. And if you had um, like a, a stressful day, you probably have a dream about anxiety or something that happens to you. To support this research, a study was conducted by Jack Cox Cartwright, and he took a sample of divorced people's dreams, and then he they showed that if they were stressed about their divorce, that they would also have dreams about um, their past relationships. So this supports Freud's idea that dreams are unconscious desires. Unlike Freud, Dr. Hobson studied and he found um, the activation process theory. This is where um, dreams result that from the brain have a spontaneous activity. Okay. So this would be um, either like the neurons and the red 
questions are the signal being sent to the brain. So it's just a random amount of information going through your brain, and it's your brain, in order to have a dream, connects them and makes a story out of them. So this is the first theory that was stated that showed that dreams have no emotional significance. And it's very controversial because a lot of people believe that um, dreams are some way that God can communicate to us. So the series of Sigmund Freud and um, the active synthesis theories have the most influential have been most influential in dream analysis in modern day. So today I will talk about the history and the different theories of dreams. And as for our own dreams, we need to decide the significance for of them for ourselves. Or just be grateful because we're college students and if we're dreaming with mountains that are sleeping. Right, so Irene, what did you think? Uh, well, I really like your, um, I just wanted your shapes and your matching and those things. And the visuals were really useful because whenever you um, copy the interview, you can show us a, a visual and give us, even when you gave one of the examples, you gave a visual to that. Um, you did look a little nervous, a little shaky up there. At the beginning, your voice started to crack because then you caught up with it. And, um, All right. Uh, I I thought you did a very nice job with the attention device. It was uh, interesting and kind of had a funny twist on it there, and it led right into the topic. You did a good job citing what the topic was and giving us your thesis statement. I thought your preview was not as distinct as it should be, um, I, but there was some setup of what the content was going to be. Uh, the internal organization, it, it's topical in nature. So that's okay. The signposts and the transitions, though, were very smooth. So you did a good job on those things. I liked uh, the fact that you consistently cited uh, information in the presentation. Usually you said where it came from when you were talking about the different theories. I think um, you could talk a little bit more about uh, where the Freudian, I mean, you're not quoting Freud's work, so, but somebody writing about Freud, so I think you need to attribute that kind of information. But you were doing that on other topics, so uh, you know I think a little bit stronger there than um, you know we had earlier, uh, and and that's a good thing. But there are still places where you could do a little bit better job on the visual materials. I you know I thought there were only a couple of things that were a little problematic. One is that you want to double check the focus on it because I think the first couple of things were a little hard to see and it, it's just one of those things that that's a technical sort of thing. You turn around and look oh, you know and adjust the knob for a quarter of an inch and it'll all be fine. And then the uh, second one where you had the cycle of stages of the dreaming, I thought you kind of rushed through that. It was up there, you went through the stages, you read what they were and then you were done and there was not as much explanation as there might have been and you had a little bit more time so I suspect I heard people talking before class you know about the different lengths that their speeches ran when they practiced them and I suspect that uh, it's one of those things a little bit uh, different practice and you've had that going a little bit more smoother there'd have been more content there and it would have come out a little bit more thorough um, but organizationally it's good I, I like the presentation don't worry about the anxiety issues that's something that we're going to work on uh, the only thing that I thought was a little problematic is sometimes when you were speaking either you get nervous or you're finishing an idea, your voice drops a little bit, and then it's hard to kind of hear where you're going next or, or what it is you're saying there. So that'll be something to watch in the future. All right, thank you.